Welcome back to The Factory. We've got a new prototype to show you today. We'll talk a little bit about bomb optimization. And of course, it wouldn't be a factory episode if we didn't talk about some jigging as well. Let's get started. Last week on social media, we gave you a sneak peek of what Peter's been working on. And I can show you a prototype today. This is the PikaDev OLED display module. And I've had this running overnight. You can see the uptime counter is steadily ticking away, just as a little burn-in test for this prototype. So it's quite pleasing to see that everything's going well on that side of town. Just like every PicoDev module, two PicoDev connectors so you can daisy chain through it. And we've been testing this with a half meter lead just to see how it goes hanging off the end of a, of a pretty long I2C bus, no worries. Taking a look at the back of the display board, there's a lot of passives hanging off this thing. And they're all really just analog supporting components for the driver IC to drive the display. Now, when you look at typical applications of these, there's a lot of different implementations. You get quite a widespread of capacitances chosen. And often the implementation uses a lot of unique components. Like there might be two or even three unique capacitor values on that board. And this was a little bit of an experiment. We tried to optimize the bomb a little bit just to see if we could and it looks like the experiments paid off. I'm really pleased to see this because if you look closely, every capacitor here is a 2.2 microfarad cap. And there's even two in parallel here to make about 4.7. And there's only two unique resistors. Everything's a 4K7 except for this current reference, which you can't really get away from. It's a, a 390K. But I'm really pleased to see that this experiment seems to have paid off because Every unique component you bring into a design, you have to make sure you can source it, you have to stock it, you have to manage your stock of it, you have to load it onto the machine. By, by removing just one part, you save the burden of having to set up all the systems to, to find that part, take care of it, make sure you, you, you know you've got enough. We'll assemble this board just like any other that we do. We've, we'll panelize it, send it through the pick and place machine and place all these parts and send it through the reflow oven. That's without the OLED module. These definitely can't handle the heat of a reflow oven. So these will have to be put on after the fact. And we've got a few ideas for that. If you look closely at the ribbon, there are two holes through the ribbon. So we've included on the circuit board two non-plated through holes. Now maybe if we design a just a like a bare FR4 PCB with two fine pitch pins that can locate through that ribbon and into the circuit board, along with some kind of tongue that holds the ribbon down, then we'll be able to jig this so that we can put that little, that little alignment jig through the holes and it'll hold the pins down while we solder across these pins on the ribbon. I know that there are special soldering tips for soldering flat flex cable. We're just waiting for them to arrive. Last week we were playing with some ideas for a programming and test jig and this is what it's evolved into. Same basic idea as last week two PicoDev connectors so we can test both connectors at the same time and a hole for a pogo pin to poke through for programmable modules so that we can program into a UPDI pin. I'll show you with a motion sensor board because I don't have a programmable board assembled. Load the board in, connect it with the left connector that bottoms out against some stops and then slide the carriage in. And now you've got two independent connections so we can test these two connectors with separate I squared C buses. And this is being held against a pogo pin coming in the back, which will do the programming. I mentioned that I might have a bar to hold this carriage down. You can see that's not here. On one of the internal layers, the carriage has two like ears that stick out that run inside slots on an inside layer. So this is now completely retained. You can't pull it off the end and it won't fall out of the jig. This is an earlier version where I was experimenting with that idea of having a glued carriage. And I just found that was way too rigid and just left no room for error. When you glue up this part, if the connector is just out of alignment a tiny bit, you have no hope of correcting it. The, the thing just doesn't work. You can see here, if I were to bring that carriage in, that's been glued a little bit too low. And so this part is just completely useless. By going with a design that uses fasteners, there's a little bit of play so you can massage things into place, tighten up the faster, and the jig is now tuned. It also makes it probably a little bit easier to replace parts. You just undo the fasteners, put the new part in, you're good to go. So rather than replace the whole carriage assembly like in a glued model, I would just undo this plate and replace the cable. To eject the device under test, you just pull that carriage away 
and some stops catch the corners of the device under test and help pull it off that connector just for a little bit of a quality of life enhancement. And if I tune these stops on the left hand side of the jig to basically limit how far this left connector can engage, then that means that the right connector may have a stronger holding force so that when you slide this carriage away, it's more likely to, to detach from the fixed cable and then self eject off the carriage using those end stops from before. Now I designed this jig using Illustrator for no other reason than I'm pretty comfortable using it. You know, you can quickly make a single panel graphic design that you can laser cut out very quickly with more complex designs like this that have many layers that interact with each other and sliding fits. It would probably make more sense to use a, a dedicated like 3D CAD package. I know there are CAD packages out there that are good at generating files for the laser cutter. I just haven't taken the plunge. If there are any laser cutting aficionados watching, let me know your thoughts. Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to use something a little more parametric for projects like this. I suppose Fusion 360 could work, but if I was going to go with Autodesk, we'd be using Eagle instead of KiCad. Let's keep it open source. Looking forward to using this. I'll probably grow the bottom layer so it can fixture onto a programming and test PCB. And we're not too far from that because the prototype RGB LED module has arrived. So we'll be able to prototype these in parallel. In any case, that's all I have for you this week. Let us know your recommendations for free laser cutting CAD software. And until next time, thanks for watching.